بكت عيني بكت عيني بكت عيني على ذنبي وما لاقيت من كربي فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب Today's khatir, I thought I'd do something slightly different. Uh, we speak a lot about the biographies of famous people, famous scholars, and almost invariably they happen to be men. Today, let's do a biography of a famous female in our history, and a person who has left an interesting mark, if you like, and interesting anecdotes around her. And this is the great-granddaughter of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not many people know about her life and times, but she is uh, somebody that is well known in the books of history. And she has gone through a number of tragedies and also left her mark as well. Her name is Sukaina bint al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Sukaina bint al Hussein. So this is Hussein's daughter radiallahu anhu. Hussein, you all know, the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Hussein's daughter is Sukaina. So in today's brief khatira, I want to give you some highlights of her life. Uh, and just a, a bit of an academic note that we don't know that much about her life. And even some of the details, there's sometimes, you know, uh, two different opinions. So what I'm going to say is one narrative. If you go to the books, you might find another opinion. But for these khatiras, we just have to be at least one narrative. So Sukaina bint al Hussein, in fact, even her birth and even the marriage of her parents is itself a story. It is said that once Ali radiallahu an was sitting in the majlis of Umar ibn Khattab, Umar ibn Khattab, and Ali was sitting with Hassan and Hussein. And a man came into the gathering. Hassan and Hussein are young children. They're not married yet. A man came to the gathering, tall, handsome, dressed very elegantly. They didn't recognize who he was. And he walked through the crowd as a person of dignity, like he's coming straight to Umar ibn al-Khattab. And the crowd becomes quiet, like, who is this man? And he's literally walking all the way to Umar. And he says to him the greetings of Jahiliyyah. Right? So he doesn't say, Assalamu alaikum. And Umar says, Who are you? And he says, I am Imr al Qais, the chieftain of the Banu Kinda. By the way, for the Arabs here, this is not the famous Imr al Qais of the poet, Qifa uh, Nabki, Min Dhikra Habibu Manzari. That's another Imr al Qais. That's before Islam. That's the Jahili poet. Imr al Qais is a famous name. This is one of the people named Imr al Qais. Uh, his tribe, the Banu Kinda, or you can say the Kilab tribe, uh, you have from it Zayd ibn Haritha, the adopted son of the Prophet, quote unquote. You have also Dihya al Kalbi. These are the people from that tribe. And this tribe was known for its handsomeness. That's why when Jibreel would come, he would take the form of who? Dihya al Kalbi. Right? So the, amongst the Arabs, this tribe was known. It was taller than most Arabs, and they had this elegance and uh, you know, demeanor about them. So this is a man who's the chieftain. And he said to Umar al-Khattab, I am a Christian, and I have heard of Islam, and I want to embrace it. So explain Islam to me. So Umar al-Khattab explained Islam to him, and he said the shahada on the spot. And when he said the shahada, Umar al-Khattab said, hand me the spear. So, you know, in Victorian England, what they do is they take the, the knife or the sword and they knight you, right? Okay, in Arabia, they would take a spear and they would invest an office in you. So he said, hand me the spear of investing, like basically I'm going to appoint him. And he appointed him the governor of that entire region. One of the people sitting in the audience said, I have never seen a man who didn't offer a single rak'ah that was appointed a governor in the time of Umar other than this man. He hadn't even said a prayer yet. But because of his demeanor, his dignity, his background, Umar ibn Khattab made him the governor immediately. And so he returned to his community a governor. When he left, Ali radiallahu anh went outside the masjid with his sons Hassan and Hussein. And he said, I am the son-in-law of the Prophet from the Banu Quraysh, the Banu Hashim, I'm Ali ibn Abi Talib, and I want my children and yours to have the bond of marriage, right? In those days, that's how they did it. The fathers would just talk and the children followed along, as you're aware, right? So, Imr al-Qais said, what a noble family. How can I say no? I give my daughters to Hassan and Hussein. Okay? So, Imr al-Qais, this noble chieftain, the, 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 the governor, he gave his, one of his daughters to Hassan radiallahu anh and another to Hussein. At the time, they were young. When they got older, they got married. So, 
Rabab bint Imra al Qais married Hussein radiallahu an. From this marriage came two girls, Ruqayya and Sukaina. And Sukaina was the younger of the two, Ruqayya and Sukaina. So Ruqayya and Sukaina are born in Medina. And because of the Umayyad revolt, the Umayyads come and they, you know, capture Medina. As you know, they tried to force the, the oath of allegiance. And as you are aware, Hussein radiallahu an, did he ever give the oath to the Umayyads? Yes or no? Did he ever, he, he never gave the oath to the Umayyads, right? So Hussein radiallahu an fled to, where did he go? Mecca, right? Who was in charge of Mecca at the time? Abdullah ibn Zubayr. So Hussein radiallahu an spent some time in Mecca and Ruqayya, and uh, Sukaina are raised a few, a few, for a period of time, a few years in Mecca. And this is where we began to hear. So Sukaina is now probably a preteen, probably. Like young lady, not quite a lady yet, right? Yet old enough to engage in conversation, talk and whatnot. And her reputation begins to spread. Her grandmother is Fatima, binti Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa right? Her grandmother is Fatima, her grandfather is Ali, and the Prophet is her great-grandfather. And she became known in the entire city as a very sharp-witted, very intelligent, and also it is known that she was a beautiful lady. And how can she not be when she is from Banu Hashim and her ancestors are as they are? And uh, Hussein radiallahu anhu would allow Sukaina to accompany him in some gatherings. She would respond and speak and versify, and she became known even as a young child as a poetess. She would make lines of poetry even as a young lady and she became known for her entire life as being of the most famous poets of her generation and of course she's a young lady growing up of course she becomes the talk of the town and the eligible bachelors want to marry her and one of the most aspiring claimants was none other than the brother of Abdullah ibn Zubair, the youngest brother, and that is Mus'ab ibn Zubair, not Urwa. There's another brother, Urwa, famous, Urwa. So there's lots of brothers. Abdullah ibn Zubair is the Sahabi, son of the Sahabi, grandson of the Sahabi, right? Zubair, the Hawadi of the Prophet, his son is Abdullah. Abdullah born the first year in Medina. Abdullah's younger brother, Mus'ab, who's not a Sahabi, okay? He didn't see the Prophet. His younger brother, Mus'ab, became infatuated with uh, Sukaina. And by the way, you know, a lot of us have this image of, of early Islam as if they're not human beings. What's wrong with wanting to marry a pious lady? This infatuation doesn't involve secret night trips or, no, it's just her lineage and her personality. There's no private meeting between the two. But all of Mus'ab's friends know he's infatuated. He wants to marry Sukaina. So they tease him, why don't you go apply for the position? And he knock on the door of Hussein radiallahu anh, and say, and Mus'ab, he was known for his whole life, he was known as being uh, a man who exuded a sense of, of, of extreme yani, rujula or manliness. Like he never wanted to be humiliated. He had this sense of, I am the man. So he said to his friends, if Hussein radiallahu anh, says no to me, how can I possibly show my face anywhere, right? He was so embarrassed about rejection that he did not propose to uh, Sukaina because of this, that what if what if he says no? How can I you know, go around and show my face? So he had that sense of, of pride in him that, yani halal pride, nothing wrong with this. Like, I don't want anybody to say no to me. Eventually, Hussein radiallahu anh engages Sukaina to her cousin. That's uh, uh, Abdullah ibn al Hassan, so Hassan's son, right? So her first cousin. And they march to Kufa, Karbala. You understand Karbala is happening. Ha uh, Abdullah and Sukaina have not yet consummate to the marriage. They're simply, a, as they say, katf kitab. So there's an agreement that they're going to get married. So Abdullah does not actually live with Sukaina. So they go to Karbala. You know what happens in Karbala, right? The entire clan of the Banu Hashim, you know, 70 plus people went there. All of the men were massacred. As you're aware, Sukaina's in the tent. She's hearing everything, right? She knows exactly what's going on. She's the one, the wounded are coming back in. She's treating them and, you know, witnessing what's happening. And then her and the women of the, the tent, I mean, when, when finally the battle is over, the troops, you know, open up the tent. They shouldn't have done that. And they barge in and they say, march to the palace, you know, of Ibn Ziyad in Kufa. And they march Sukaina barefoot, barefoot. She is the great granddaughter of the Prophet Sallallahu They march her to Abdullah Ibn Ziyad's uh, palace. And there, there is threatened of killing even Zain al-Abidin, you know, the one son that was left 
of Hussein radiallahu anhu, he was sick in the tent, right? So this is Sukaina's older brother, but from a different mother, half brother. Sukaina's older brother from a different mother. So there's even talk of killing him. And it is said that Sukaina spoke to Ibn Ziyad. Sukaina, and she is a tween. She's literally not even a, a full lady yet. She's, you know, 11, 12 years old. And she says a very harsh statement. Are you not content with all of the blood? Is it not enough? All the blood of the family of the Prophet you've killed? Aren't you happy? Haven't you done enough damage? And it is even said that she hugged her brother that you dare kill him, you have to go through me. This is a young child, a young girl, and her bravery is being demonstrated by the ones who murdered her entire family, and she's in that uh, palace. And it is even said that one of the ruffians or the troops, he begged Ibn Ziyad to take Sukaina as a jawadi, you know, if you get the point. And Ibn Ziyad at least had some one line he drew that I'm not going to do that. So they sent then the family to uh, Damascus, and there Yazid, it is said, gifted them, honored them, sent them back to, um, to Medina. And so Sukaina returns to Medina. Abdullah ibn Zubayr is now getting more and more active. His younger brother finally proposes. There's no Hussein anymore, right? So they get married, subhanAllah. This is a type of love story in his own way. So eventually they get married. So the first marriage was not consummated with Abdullah uh, ibn al-Hasan. So Mus'ab ibn al-Zubayr and Sukaina get married and it seems like this was the happiest time of her life. They had some children. Uh, her, uh, Abdullah, Abdullah ibn al-Zubayr made his younger brother the governor of Iraq. He lived a few years as a successful yani, warrior and fighter and governor. And Mus'ab, the younger brother, was the right hand of Abdullah ibn al-Zubayr. He was the one who defended the you know, uh, dominion of Ibn Zubayr, did everything his brother wanted. And so the Umayyads decided to take him out. He's now the big guy up north in the uh, Kufan region. And so they send the famous Hajjaj Ibn Yusuf, his, everybody should know his name, the infamous general. And he makes it a point to attack Mus'ab Ibn Zubayr in a famous battle. And Sukaina is again present subhanallah and so she loses her husband in another battle against the Umayyads and also just like you know Hussein radiallahu anh, his head was cut off so too Mus'ab there was a time frame I know it's shocking to hear there was a time frame where this pagan practice became common in some circles you would cut off the head of the enemy and send it to the palace this became common for a few years then it became uncommon after that but for a while it was common so Mus'ab's head also was severed and Sukaina saw this and whatnot so can you imagine Sukaina by the way saw the bodies of Hussein radiallahu anh, and the entire family outside the tent she saw that and it is said that she touched it and kissed it and whatnot now she sees the body of her husband Musab and also the father of her children after this it appears that her marriages were not of that nature either her husband's died so perhaps four marriages after this we don't know exactly how many and by the way those days if a lady was single nobody cared whether she's widowed or whatnot a single lady she was proposed to it was understood that somebody has to take care of her, right? The concept of a lady being single was very rare. And in our culture, as you're aware, it's very different. Like once a lady becomes widowed or, or divorced, khalas, nobody can touch her. But in that society, they understood somebody has to take care of her, somebody has to marry her. There was no stigma attached to marriage, remarriage. It is said she had four, maybe even five, according to one book, six husbands. Of course, they include Al Hassan, sorry, Abdullah ibn Hassan, who never got actual nikah done except for the Katab Kitab. But after Mus'ab, a number of husbands. Now, here, Sukaina's personality is shown. Again, we have um, a Per, uh, we have an image. Oh, I forgot to mention a very important thing. Uh, we learn as well when she was growing up in Mecca. This is something very interesting, guys. We have a very, very naive notion of reality. One of the things Sukaina was known for, can you believe it, was a new hairstyle that she invented. And it was called a turra as sukainiya the Sukainiya hairstyle. As a young lady, 11, 12, 13 years old, that's what young ladies do. What do you expect them to do, right? She's at her home and she... She had very long, beautiful hair, it is said. So she made a certain type of knot and a certain hairstyle. And the ladies of Mecca began imitating Sukaina's hairstyle. And it became the vogue. So much so, the books of history mention some men began imitating. Because back then men had long hair as well. Some men began doing it. The governor in Medina, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, said, If I catch any man doing this, I'm going to whip him. Because it's effeminate. Let the women do it. No problem. Point is... 
Who could have ever imagined that the great granddaughter of the Prophet is going to start something in fashion? Think about that, right? That she was that type of personality. She wanted to have that, so she had a different hairstyle called Atturra al suakaini It's known in the books of, of history. In any case, back to her story as an adult. We forgot to mention this as, as a teenager. She went through a number of you know, marriages. Some of her husbands passed away. And one or two, she divorced. So one famous incident. So she married the grandson of Uthman radiallahu anh. And by the way, this notion that some groups have, that there was tension between Ali radiallahu anh and between Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman. Wallahi, it's not true at all. You just look at history. How can it be that Sukaina is marrying the grandson of Uthman radiallahu anh? How can it be? There is no problem, right? There's no issues between them. So the, uh, he, he dies, you know, a natural death. Then another person proposed, son of um, uh, Talha bin Ubaidullah, one of the Ashram of Bashara. But he was known for being a very stingy man. And he was very wealthy but very stingy. So Sukaina made conditions upon him. This is well known in the books of fiqh. The great granddaughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi she said to this man, if you want to marry me, number one, you shall not marry any woman besides me. You shall not touch a lady besides me as long as I'm your wife. She put that condition, right? Nowadays, books of fiqh discuss. She put that condition. Number two, she had other conditions as well that uh, I will have access to your wealth because he was a very stingy man, etc., etc. It so happened, this man did take a milk yameen, a jariya, right? Sukaina found out about it and she dragged him to the court and the judge. And she said, khalas, and I get my, my, my mahar back because he disobeyed the contract. Literally, this is the great granddaughter of the Prophet. ﷺ. And it is said that when the judge was there, silent, not knowing what to do, she turned to the husband and she said, He's, Take a good look at me because this is the last time you will ever see me after this day. <laughs> and that's the, the marriage ended over there. It is said after this that she remained a single lady. She didn't get married after that, but she became known for her poetry. And her poetry is recorded in the books of history, so much so that some of the most famous poets of the time, people like Jarir and Farazdaq, if you know your Arabic poetry, you've all heard of Farazdaq and his names. Farazdaq would make it a point to visit the house of Sukaina from the outside and exchange poetry. And it is said that in one occasion after Hajj, the famous poets of Arabia gathered and they decided to hold a competition and they chose Sukaina to be the judge. Sukaina is going to decide who's the best sha'ir amongst us. That was her reputation, that she's going to be the, the hakam between us. And she lived an apolitical life after this, and she was known for her generosity and her wit, and she passed away in the year 117 of the Hijra. She was born 49, it is said, some say 47. 49 Hijra, she was born, and she passed away 117 Hijra, and she is buried in Baqi al Gharqad with most of the, uh, the Al uh, Banu Abdul Muttalib. And this shows us, really, subhanAllah, that our conception of the past, you know, the people lived, it's actually very different than reality. And when you read books of history, it actually makes you more broad-minded. It makes you understand that the versions of society we think existed never really existed. Nothing wrong with a lady showing, you know, her talent in a halal manner. She's properly dressed. Everybody knows her. There's no, nothing you know, negative going on. Her personality was known. She did certain things in fashion. She did certain things in poetry. She participated, not on the battlefield, but she was with Hussein radiallahu anh, you know, on, in Karbala and with her husband Mus'ab but obviously not armed to the hill, but still uh, participating in her own way, and she left her mark on history. So this is a name that we should be aware of, the great granddaughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on her and on all of them. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أحال النار حول خليله روحا وريحانا بقولك كون